Uh, we got a good morning this morning. If you would, turn to Acts chapter 10. I love whenever I'm reading along and just doing quiet time devotions and stuff and something really just jumps out, you know? Um, anytime we were trying to determine what God wants us to teach on, you know, we go through our, our own little systems of, of praying and seeking God and asking if he's like moving anything in our spirit specifically. And sometimes it's just really hard, you know, and you're like, well, I guess it's just letting me pick. And sometimes he just just throws something out there for you that's that's pretty obvious that it's him. Well, he he did that with me for this message. He um, really just threw it out there for me, and he made it blatantly clear that this is what he wanted me to teach on, which is great because anytime I have to pick, I always question it. But Acts chapter 10 is, uh, it kind of goes along really well with what Rod taught on last week. And if any of you were here last week, most of you were, it looks like. Um, glad you're back, bro. Uh, it was, man, it was just so good. And it, it, it brings us back to the, the understanding of, of God's heart the understanding of, of his passion for us, the fact that he wants to have a relationship with us and not just um, a bunch of, of strict rules, which, you know, rules are absolutely necessary. I would never speak against um, having rules. They are, God is a God of, of structure. Um, and he's also a God of love. You know, he's a God of mercy and kindness. And so as I'm reading... Um, Acts chapter 10, he was really just working on my heart big time. And my relationship with him is just so precious because of who I was and where I've been in my life, the nasty, the gross, the, the ugly, the mean, the, you know, all the junk that you don't want to be. And then to have a God, the God, Say, I still want you. I still want to have a relationship with you. I love you so much. It's just mind-blowing. So, throughout the Word, we've got just these, all the Old Testament is, is leading up to and preparing the way for Jesus. And it's types and shadows, and it's, it's just so blatantly clear to us, you know, now looking back. And the, the covenants that he had with his children and the fact that the, uh, the Israelites were his chosen people, you know, and all the different ways that he communicated with them and he, he walked with them and he was, he was with them and talked to them and took care of them and brought them back whenever they were gone or they were lost and they purposefully walked away from him. But all these things were leading up to the Messiah. They were leading up to Jesus and and they rightfully understood, they, they believed, the Jews believed that, um, that they were his chosen people and they were his chosen people, but they believed because of that, that the, Jew, uh, the Gentiles, the, the nasty, filthy, uncircumcised Gentiles, they were not somebody that God would ever want to even be around. You know, they believed that it was a nasty uh, sin and you would get defiled if you even went into their house if you even walked into their house. So, as, as Jesus comes and he lives this life and he tells us how he loves us and, and what heaven is like, and then he's, he's led to be crucified and he rises again. And now we end up in, in the book of Acts. And it's, this just breaks down um, the, the kind of the the living that they were going through at that point in time. You know, everything was so new. Things were so revealed or becoming revealed. They had already been revealed, but they're trying to understand what this all looks like now. And Rod painted a great picture of that, laid out so much last week. And so this kind of just piggy tails onto that. 
piggybacks. Piggybacks, not piggy tails. That's weird. Piggy tail hill. Whatever. So, I'm going to be bouncing back and forth probably from my Bible Bible to my Bible app and some notes that I have here and stuff, but essentially, we're going to read basically all the way through uh, Acts chapter 10. And once we do that, then I'm going to come back and I'm going to start highlighting stuff that God was just throwing out there to me. So if you're there, you can follow along. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. I know that sometimes whenever you, you're following along in a different version, it's, it's kind of difficult to follow along. So if you want, you can just listen. Um, but if you want to follow along right now, you can. It says, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. That had to be a little shocking. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier, who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now we jump over to Peter's vision. And Rod read this last week too, but it's right in line. So about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied in straight-up Peter fashion. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about, wondering about what the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision... The Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. Go up, get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I am the one you are looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. They were probably thinking, I got to see what this is all about. The following day, he arrived at Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting him and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. While walking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, You are well aware it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So, when I was sent, when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. 
May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Three days ago, I was in my house praying at, at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has, has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who, the Lord, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, Judea beginning in Galilee, after the baptism of, that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the, in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now listen to this. This is wild. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So think about the stage that is set here. There's so much that has happened since Jesus was crucified. And all these things are being revealed in stages, just like Rod was talking about last week. So let's break some of this down just a little bit, because I... I I just, I love it. I'm so passionate about it. So, Acts 10, 1 and 2, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion. The centurion obviously means that he was over 100 soldiers. We've covered that. Um, century, Syrian, uh, centurion means that he's over 100. But this is the Italian regiment. So you can tell kind of, what region that they're, that they're close to, um, and where he came from. But it says that he and his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Now, as I started reading this, and I don't know, I, there may not be any correlation whatsoever, but if you look at the centurion in Matthew... 16, 18, um, I'm sorry, it's, no, I'm sorry, that's not where it is, but it is in Matthew. Um, I don't have it on these notes, apparently. But the centurion in Matthew that, that had a servant that was dying, was sick and dying, right? You guys remember that? And he, he sends Jews to go meet with Jesus to ask him to come back to his place to, um, to heal his sick servant. That same centurion, it says that he was very well respected and loved by all the Jews, that he gave to the poor, and he was the one that built the, the synagogue there in their town. Now, the difference is, though, that um, 
that town was Capernaum, and where they are right now with this centurion is Caesarea. So, that there's, there's a little bit of a difference, but if you were to drive that, it'd take you about an hour and a half drive from there. However, it'd be about a 19-hour walk. So, it, I'm sure that they moved around just like our military does, but I don't know. I just thought, man, there's a lot of similarities between these two, so it just got my juices flowing. You guys might want to look into it more if you want, but maybe you don't want to. Nevertheless, it says that he was God-fearing and he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God. This angel came to him. It came to him. This dude's a Gentile. He's uncircumcised. He's not a Jew, obviously. He's, he's still a centurion in the Italian um, legion, or in the Italian regiment here. He's still a Roman centurion. But he loves God. He's praying to God. He's following the will of God by taking care of those in need. And because of that, God goes to him. God sends an angel to him. Keep in mind, this is totally against the law of the Jews. It's totally against what they believe to be necessary. Like, God, God didn't care. God went, went to him, met him where he is. I just, I love that. So he goes to him. He distinctly saw an angel. And he says, Cornelius. And, it, you know, that it's like, what? I, have any of you guys ever been standing there, like, reading something like this and been thinking to yourself, what, it, what would I do if God sent an angel to my house? You know, and all of a sudden, I'm standing there, you know, you close the refrigerator door, and boom, there's an angel sent. <laughs> you know, I mean, I would trip out. <laughs> it, it would be everything I could not to shoot an angel on the accident, you know? But, so here he is, seeing this angel, and it says that he stared at him with fear. Stared at him with fear. He says, what is it, Lord, he asked. And the angel answered him and says, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. This is, does this not blow your mind? This dude, this Gentile in the Roman army who were known to be extremely brutal and disgusting, but this dude loves God. This dude loves God and because of that, he's been praying and his prayers and his gift to the poor, his gifts to the poor have come up to God. They have come up to God as a memorial offering before God. That means that that God is seeing these things, He's hearing these things, and He's loving these things. He's loving it. It's a memorial offering to Him. I love it. So, here He is being met by this angel. And the angel's telling Him that, that, that God just that God loves him, you know? And at the same time that this kind of stuff is, is going on, God's starting to work in Peter's heart. God's starting to work in his heart here. And he says, the angel tells him, go send for Peter. To the best of our knowledge, this guy has never met Peter, doesn't know him, but the angel tells him, who to go get, and exactly where to go get him. So he's like, okay, cool. Takes two of his servants, and the third one that he sends is another Roman soldier. But it says that this Roman soldier is devout. That term devout means that he, he believed in God. He was, he, his religion was, was correct. You know, his, his heart was correct. His heart was correct, and he believed in God. He wanted to have that relationship with God. 
So we got these two different Roman, Roman soldiers here that, um, that have obviously been very much so impacted by Jesus, by the life of Jesus. And it says that his whole family, the centurion, his whole family believed. And, and don't you think, and this is one of those similarities, don't you think that it had to have taken something pretty drastic for them to, uh, to believe? Because they, otherwise they would have never believed. So if they see their servant get raised from the dead, I'm sure that they probably would have believed, right? So that was just another one of those similarities that I kind of like, well, that very well could have happened, but I don't know. I don't know. So don't hold me to it. Yeah, so it says whenever the angel had gone, then Cornelius calls them in and they go. So at about noon the following day, they were on their journey. Um, they were going... They were going to Joppa, right, to, uh, to get Peter. So from Caesarea to Joppa, and Joppa is modern-day Tel Aviv. If you all know where that is, it's a big, beautiful city, actually, gorgeous city. And it's only about a 56-minute drive. However, it is at least a 12-and-a-half-hour walk. So they were, they were taken off down there to go get him. So it was quite a distance. So the following day, it says... That, that they're going down through there. And the only reason I bring that up is because my analytical mind, it's always like, well, what's the actual time frame? What's the difference? What was the terrain like? How did they get there? You know, all this stuff. And so I want to know those little weird details too. So that's why I threw them in there for you. Sorry. Um, so, but about noon the next day, they were approaching the, the town there. And Peter went up on the roof to pray. And he became hungry. That happens to me all the time whenever I pray. I always become hungry. I don't know. It's, it's just something about it. So he went up there, and while he, was, while he was praying, he fell into a trance, it says. They were preparing food for him, but he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven open up, and this something like a large sheet being let down, right? And he sees all the stuff in it. It's unclean animals, whatever. But then this voice says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This kind of reminds me. It reminded me of Peter. And... Some of his conversations with Jesus, whenever Jesus would say something or want him to do something and he would argue with him, here he is again arguing with an angel. Um, I love Peter to death, but he, uh, it, it shows that he continued to kind of have this issue. <laughs> but anyway, so he's, he's still, he's still kind of hung up in that whole thing of, of all these I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. You know, follow the, the letter of the law to the T, which is, is understandable and it's good. Um, but God tells him here, he's not just talking about food. He is talking about food, but he's also not just talking about food. And this vision comes just a couple days before he ends up back at Cornelius' house, which he's not supposed to enter according to Jewish law. But God, God works things out in our lives at the right time for the right reason to allow us to prepare the way for whatever it is that we, we have to do. And God is getting ready to change the face of, of the world. He's getting ready to change the face of the earth here. And he's, he's clearly showing them that he has sheep from other she uh, sheep folds that he's about to bring in. And this is all getting ready to happen. Up until now, it's all been about the, um, the Israelites and the Jews. That's, that's what all this has been about. But Jesus, he had consistently laid the, laid the stage throughout his entire uh, teachings on earth for what's getting ready to happen right now. And this is huge. This, is the, this that's getting ready to happen is the only reason that we get to have a relationship with God. What's getting ready to happen blew the doors off, and now we get to come in boldly as well. So, we've got Peter here. He's arguing about this stuff, but the, voice, uh, the angel tells him three times um, exactly what he's, what he's wanting him to, 
break off, the traditions that he's wanting him to overcome so that his relationship with God and, and all of our relationship, our relationships with God can continue on. So it says that while Peter was still thinking about the vision the Spirit had said to him, Simon came up and told him, hey, three men are here looking for you. So get up and go downstairs, or I'm sorry, the, the vision, the angel in the vision told him, three men are here looking for you, so get up and go downstairs, and do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So we've got, we've got Cornelius has this vision with the angel, tells him to go get Peter. Over here, Peter has this vision with the angel telling him, go to Cornelius' house. They both line up together, boom, he didn't know Cornelius, Cornelius didn't know him, but God, um, God created and ordained this meeting to happen. So he went down, and they just basically tell him who Cornelius is, and I already told you kind of my thought process behind some of that, but he says that a holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. That's a, that's a pretty convincing um, invitation, if you will. I love it. So it says, though, the next day Peter started out with them and, and some of the believers from Joppa, they went along. And then the following day he arrived. And like I said, it was, you know, a 12 and a half hour walk if you're just going straight there. And so with that many people, obviously it's not like a forced march. They didn't have to go real fast in those days. They took their time getting where they needed to go, and I'm sure they probably had, some of them had kids and stuff like that, but it took a little bit of, a little bit of time to get there, and so he tells them, it says the next day they arrive. Peter enters the house, and Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. All of that is, you know, you've got to think about the the traditions and the, the religions and all the different religions of the time and, and the customs of, of how you show reverence and honor and stuff like that to people. And so he falls down to uh, basically to honor Peter. And Peter says, dude, stand up. I'm just a man. This is, you don't worship me. So then it says that, uh, that there was a large gathering at the house. That's what I love about Cornelius, you know. He was, he was a, a man of influence, and he wanted people to get to meet God. He wanted to show people what it was like to have a relationship, and he knew he just had this, this conversation with an angel that told me to bring this guy, so whatever he's going to say, you're going to want to be here for it. So he gathers a bunch of people. They all come in, and, and Peter walks inside, and it's like, wow, okay, you, you brought a lot of people. Great, I brought a lot of people too. So there's this big gathering going on in this house, right? And he says to them, y'all are aware that I'm not supposed to be here, right? You do know that it's against the Jewish law for me to even come into your house. I'm not supposed to be here. He says, but God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Right there. He just broke it off. He says, this is, this is the law, the tradition. This is what I'm not supposed to do. But this is what God clearly told me is okay now. So I'm not going to not come in due to these traditions because God told me that I can't call you unclean anymore. And it's not going to make me unclean to come in here. He had the the epiphany, the, the understanding now that it is okay for me to come in here. So he comes in. Before I go any farther, if you look in, you don't have to turn there, but you can. Matthew 16, 18 and 19. I just want to remind you guys that, that God chose Peter to do this. God specifically picked him to do this right here. And he tells him in Matthew 16, 18, he says, And I tell you 
that you are Peter, because he was Simon. God is changing his name at this point and says, I tell you, you are Peter or Petra or rock, the foundation, the base. You are the base. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That is who he chose to go bind this junk on earth and it will be bound in heaven, to go loose this on earth, and it will be loosed in heaven. He chose Peter to do this for a very specific reason. And he gave him the power and the authority to be able to do it. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. This is being opened wide up for us right now. And he's having this, this epiphany, and so he's starting to wonder, God, what is it that you're doing, God? What is it that you're doing? I know that you've called me here. I know that you've told me not to call things unclean, that you have made clean, that you have made. These, these are your people, so I'm not going to call them unclean. I am going to boldly go into their home. And guess who boldly went into his home first before Peter ever got there? The angel. God was communicating with him. God was meeting him. And he was praying to God. And it was a blessing to God, this dude that was unclean, that by his laws were considered unclean. These things were blessing God. I just love it. I love it. So it says, so when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask you why you sent me? Now, if you remember the guys that showed up, they already told him that who Cornelius was and the fact that Cornelius just had this, this revelation, this this meeting with an angel, and the angel told him to come get Peter. But he's asking him, he's basically saying, I want to hear it from you. So Cornelius rolls down through the, the whole thing and tells him again, and, and uh, tells him where the angel told him that he could find him and everything. You know, Peter had to be going, man, that's cool. That is so cool. There's no way this guy could know where I was. And the angel told him exactly where I'd be. That is neat. Don't you love whenever you know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that you are where God wants you, when God wants you to be there, doing what he wants you to do? It's a humbling thing. Honestly, it's extremely humbling to know that the God that created everything sees you right where you are, who you are, how you are even. And he still has purpose for you. Peter, think about this. Y'all remember whenever he was out fishing after Jesus was crucified and then he comes back and he, Jesus is over there on the, on the shore cooking up some fish for him that he's out trying to fish for and can't catch anything. And he comes in and that's whenever Jesus takes that opportunity to heal him from his, his broken heart from, from denying Jesus three times. And then Jesus personally takes that opportunity and asks him three different times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really love me? And he says, yes. He says, feed my sheep. He, le he healed his broken heart at that point. You know, this is the same dude. This is the same Peter, you know? And, and so Peter, you know that he, he's probably somewhat similar to me in his thinking of, man, I'm constantly putting my foot in my mouth like this, like the Matthew 16, 18 and 19. Right after that, Jesus tells them that, tells all of them that he's going to go be crucified. And Peter says, absolutely not. I'm not letting you die. And he looks at him and tells him, get behind me, Satan. He tells him, I'm going to build my rock on you. You are the rock that I'm going to build my church on. And the next sentence, he says, get behind me, Satan. Peter would be like, oh my goodness, what in the world? This is the same dude, though. This is the same guy, Right? And he's getting to hear that God is speaking not only to him, but also to this disgusting Gentile. Speaking the same thing, the same one, speaking the same thing. The, the dots that are getting connected here are coming down to this. So then Peter began to speak. He listens to this, and he had to be in absolute awe. But he's listening to what Cornelius is saying. 
And it says, then he began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Friends, this blows racism out of the water. And I'm not a real politi political dude whatsoever. Believe me, I'm not. But this blows racism out of the water. This blows my preconceived ideas of any people group out of the water. Because this right here tells me that they all have an opportunity. They all get to have a relationship with the same God that made me and the same God that made you. All they have to do is fear him and do what he says. So, he goes on and he's talking about the message of Jesus Christ and how he is the Lord of Lords that he went and preached all this stuff. And he talks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. God was with him through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Remember whenever Jesus is getting baptized and heaven opens and the Holy Spirit comes down, descends down and rests on Jesus and God speaks from above, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Well, that's what Peter's talking about here. He was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He is God. Jesus is God. And, but then Peter goes on and he confirms all these different things saying that we are witnesses of everything that he did, but we're also witnesses of whenever he rose from the dead, he went around and he makes it clear that he was eating and drinking with them. So it couldn't have been a spirit. It had to be flesh and blood because a spirit is not going to be able to consume food. You would see it like, whoop, you know, like <laughs> it's got to be flesh and blood. He's confirming. And the people that he brought along with him some of them probably saw Jesus too. Some of them probably were right there in the midst. He's talking about all the things that Jesus did and what they saw. And that he was, he went around healing the sick. He went around casting out demons and stuff. And then he says, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. And then he goes further and he says, All the prophets testify about him, about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So he's talking about all the prophets of the law. So he's sitting here trying to process all this stuff through. He's like, man, yes, the prophets literally testified of Jesus' coming. And now Jesus is giving you Gentiles the same, the same stuff he's bringing me to you to do this. And, and so... All these things are getting, getting solidified in his mind of what, what's actually happening here. And it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. Was he doing anything, anything amazing here? No, he's just speaking the truth. He's just telling them what God called him to do. He just went and he's speaking to them about Jesus. That's what he's doing right here. He's literally just being obedient and speaking to them about Jesus Christ. And it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The Holy Spirit wanted to be there, and he came on all who that, was, who that were hearing the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. This is, this is stinking awesome. I'm trying to not jump around up here. But this is awesome. 
the Spirit falls into this place. They're speaking in tongues. These guys that thought that that could never happen are seeing it happen right in front of their face going, what is going on here? This, this can't be. How, can this be? How can this be? We never thought that this was going to happen, but here it is happening right here in front of our face. And it's not, you can't deny it because they're speaking in tongues. The power of the Holy Spirit is filling this place. When the Holy Spirit falls in a place and it fills that place, you can feel it. I'm telling you, like for me, the hair or <laughs> hair follicles, the, the hair where there should be hair is standing up, you know? You can feel him. You can feel him so clearly. They're feeling him and they're witnessing with their eyes what is going on. And then Peter says, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. The whole reason that he says this is because it was very difficult for um, the Jewish people to accept an outsider and, and baptize them. Because the baptism in water is forgiveness of sins. And that's why the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees got so upset whenever Jesus was saying, I forgive your sins. Rise up and walk. And they're like, they, they totally missed that some dude that just couldn't walk now is walking around. They're stuck on, did he say, I forgive your sins? You know? That was what was blowing their mind. Not the fact that this crippled dude is now walking around. That didn't surprise them any. But, but the fact that Jesus says, I forgive your sins, now get up and walk. That just totally blew their mind. But now Peter's saying, obviously... This is wide open for them too. This is wide open for these Gentiles. These people that have not been raised in, in the law, that have not been raised the way we have, that have not been living this sinless life, you know, that have not purposefully not done this and not done that and have done this and have done this. They haven't done any of that. And they're still getting baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if that's the case... God clearly wants me here because he just told me to come here and he told him to come get me to come here. So, obviously, we should be baptizing these guys with water right now. Like, what, what are we doing? Let's, let's go. Let's get some water. Let's baptize them. So, he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. The point that I want to get to, that I really want to just drive home, is that no matter how you feel like maybe you're not worthy, you are worthy. No matter how you feel like you haven't done this right, you haven't done this right, you, you, you haven't been doing this, you know that you should, but you haven't. No matter where you're at with your past, you've got to understand that God created you for a deep, intimate relationship with Him, and He wants to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He wants to, you to be baptized with water. He wants you to come into this intimate, personal relationship with Him. And the enemy doesn't want you to. He wants you to straight up believe that you're not worthy. He wants you to believe He'll even flip-flop that to where whenever you're out and about and the, the church has told you that this place, you should never go there because there's sinners there. It's nasty. You shouldn't be there. That maybe sometimes God wants you to go to those places so that you can minister to people there. Because it wasn't right for Peter to be there. It wasn't right for all those people that came along with him to be there in their mind, according to the church. But God moved miraculously there. In fact, his Holy Spirit fell there, met them there, fell in that place and changed everybody there because they were where they weren't supposed to be. Now, I will tell you, if you struggle with anything that might be going on there personally, 
don't go there. Don't put yourself in that situation unless God says, okay, I'm, I'm anointing you to go do that. Don't just be like, well, Nathan said it's fine to, fine to go there. You know, I'm bringing the light. But then you walk out looking like everybody in there. No. If you're walking in there, you better be walking out with everybody else looking like you, not you looking like them. We've been given the greatest tool, the greatest gift, the greatest opportunity to be able to do all the things that God, that Jesus did here on this earth, and even more so. The same Spirit that came down and filled Him has filled us, lives in us. Is that not amazing? That's amazing. But if we're just walking around not doing anything with it, and whenever He says, hey, Get up and go do this. And we're like, nah, I'd really rather not. I'm more comfortable right here. That's not it. That's not it. He wants to see big things happen. He wants to see big things change. He wants to see things change in you and change in everybody around you. But we have to do something about it. And we're getting ready to start this meeting the second uh, Wednesday of every month. We're going to be starting to talk about and get into the Word and find out where God's wanting to lead us in the ministry of healing. I've had that feeling for a long time that this is, that I know that God's called me to that. I've seen people healed. I've seen you guys heal people. But He's wanting more. He's wanting more. But if we just sit at home and go, man, it's going to be cool when, then that win will never come. It is going to start out one week in a month, but I, I just kind of have this prediction. I have this prediction. When we start being obedient and we start expecting Him to meet us here, and we're expecting people to be healed, delivered, set free, renewed, restored, redeemed, and He starts doing that, it's going to get all of us a little crazy excited. It is. And just like the people that were following Jesus, thousands of people following him around this huge lake just so that they can meet with them for a minute. They, they didn't even have any food, for goodness sakes. They're like, I don't care about food. They go around there because they know he's going to do something extreme. Something they had never seen before. He's going to do those extreme things in here. And this one week, one week night a month is probably not going to last too long. It's probably going to grow and explode. God's been putting corporate prayer on a lot of our hearts, getting together. You know, we did the, war, uh, the um, what's it called on the wall, warrior on the wall thing? Is that what it is? Watchmen. Watchmen on the wall. Thank you. Sorry, I don't just watch. Something comes, it's going to war. <laughs> so we did the watchman on the wall thing where someone was praying consistently. That's awesome. It's good. It's necessary. And in fact, I think we should still do it. But I think that the Word talks about the power whenever we get together in corporate prayer, that God starts changing things. He starts moving in a big, mighty, awesome way. The big, huge revival in Scotland was started by two little elderly ladies that got together and constantly prayed because they knew He would meet them there. And it blew up. I mean, it blew up. God met them there in a huge way. God's got something huge for us, guys. And it all started because he gave Peter this vision and said, what I have made unclean, don't ever call unclean. Guys, God has made you clean. Don't call yourselves unclean. He's serious about it. And I'm talking to myself because there's times where I tell myself, you're not clean, you're not worthy, you've done this and this and this. I got to stop. I got to stop. And you got to stop. Because if I'm doing that, I'm sure Satan's MO hasn't changed with you. You know, he probably lies to you the same way, right? You're not going to be able to heal people and set them free because look at you. Look at what you've done. Look what goes through your head. 
Look what you say when you're driving down the road and nobody's in the car with you. <laughs> Me and you, Jerry? <laughs> okay. Me neither. I just threw it out there, hypothetically speaking. <laughs> but that's the, that's the thing, guys. If we want change, we got to be the change. We've got to be the change. And God has put all of us here in this room together to be the change together. But this change can't stay in this room. It's going to start in this room, but it can't stay in this room. He doesn't come and bring change to keep it confined where nobody else can see it. When this change starts rolling, and it is right now, it's starting. It has already started. It's got to start getting out. But guys, let's get together. Let's pray together for one another. Build each other up in our most holy faith. Encourage one another. Be the platform for you guys to launch from. That's what we got to do. That's what we got to do, and we're going to do it together. Hey, Becky, I, I finally got a title for my message. It was, I think it was from Gentile to Beloved, somehow. So, maybe we'll use that later on. <laughs> she called me, or I don't know, maybe I called her. And she's like, hey, you got a title for your message? I'm like, uh, no, kind of, a few, I don't know. <laughs> so, I'm going to end with this. Oftentimes, we ask if, if anybody does or doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior, I want you to come up here. I mean, I'm looking around, and it looks like, for the most part, I know everybody pretty much personally, and I know that you have relationship with God. But if you, if you don't, or if you want to renew your relationship with God, come up. We'll pray for that. But we're also wanting you to come up if you feel that God is tugging on your heart to get out of the old and get into the new. If you feel like that God is calling you, leading you, drawing you, pulling you, that you know that he's got something for you, you know that he wants you to do something, that he's called you specifically for a specific purpose, but you just don't know what it is. If you just stay back there, you just go home and you just continue on the same old thing, you might not ever know. He might meet you at some point. But if you seek him out and you say, God, what is it that you want me to do? I'm going to join together with these guys. I'm going to let them pray over me. I'm going to pray over them. And we're going to figure this out. Then come up. If you don't want to come up, Raise your hand. I'll come back and pray for you where you are. I don't care. Stay seated if you want. But let's figure this out together. We want to pray for you. I want you to pray for me. So let's do this together. As, I, as we do close, if you want prayer for anything, seek us out. You know, let us know, get our attention. We're going to play some music. We're going to dim some lights. We're going to get into worship together. If you can't worship, uh, you have to leave. You got something going on, that's totally fine. That's okay. But if you can, and you want to get into worship, and you want to start drawing together, do it here. Do it here. Don't forget you got kids back there, but they could probably hold on to them for another few minutes without burning the place down maybe <laughs> Greg's like ah, but can they <laughs> but yeah I love you guys and I am really excited to continue on in ministry with you guys I can't wait to see God build you guys up to do the crazy things that you're going to do doesn't necessarily mean you might be standing up here maybe you might be I don't know but you're definitely going to be meeting somebody somewhere you're going to be changing lives for the kingdom of God, and I'm looking forward to doing it with you guys.